You are listening to Keep Canada Weird, a weekly weird news roundup by the Nighttime Podcast. Hello, listeners, and welcome to the weekly Keep Canada Weird discussion series. If you're new here, I'm Jordan Bonaparte, and in Keep Canada Weird, my pal Aaron Airport and I seek out and explore the more offbeat news stories that played out across Canada over the past week. In tonight's episode, which we recorded on April 9th of 2024, we're going to hear about a dog on a New Brunswick cliff, a jackpot in small town Newfoundland, a camera at a Noah Khan concert, and a woman who seemed to find the meaning of true love in a chance encounter with an octopus. So let's get into it. Handsome Aaron Airport. It's time to keep Canada weird, my friend. Oh, yes. Let's let's weird it up. But let's not just jump into it. Let's not get the cart before the horse. Let's hear about you first. What's new in your life? Oh, you know what I did today that was really interesting. Mm-hmm. No, I don't. I went to the I went to the dentist. Uh, what? I was at an orthodontist, not for myself. My oldest son may need braces, but nothing interesting happened other than the like kind of nurse person's name was also Jordan, which oh. is awkward because every time the the orthodontist is at Jordan, we'd both be like, yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, but tell me about your dentist appointment. <laughs> Oh, well, it wasn't nearly as interesting as that. Okay. It was just a, a clean bill of health, no cavities, no issues. Uh, and and the hygienist said that my teeth are looking better and better every, every day. time I come. Every <laughs> oh, wow. day. Yeah. Oh, congratulations. I know. A clean yeah. bill of health from the dentist. Oh, we're all proud of you, Aaron. From just the dentist. The rest of me is decaying at a rapid pace. <laughs> Speaking of your teeth, are you, do you got anything fancy that you're drinking? Because I got a big cup of tea. I just here. have some water. Yeah, no, I just got some water. But I have a cup with the letter A on it. Oh. For the viewers for, on for YouTube. For arrogant. Who are, no, for... Annoyance. Uh, for airport and Aaron. Oh, I like it. Good. Um, mm-hmm. Representing. We got we to gotta get into it here. We got a big night ahead of us. I don't recall being this excited about an episode. Oh, here, we, here we go. Here Maybe we go. that's you because do this, no, stop. You do this every time. That this is the best episode's gonna ever gonna be, and you're always pretending as if like this episode is going to trump all other episodes. There's a reason why we've been dragged through the mud over the past four weeks because of Elaine and a little mistake we made. I think. I can safely say that egg versus egg gate is all behind us. We got a fresh start on the show here. We're ready to just focus on our work, which is keeping Canada weird by seeking out, highlighting the odd news stories that pop up across this great nation. So with all that said, before we get into the stories, we got a whole bunch of voice memos. Let's hear from a listener. You remember uh, Zach? He's the, I know he has a beard. He's an American fellow. I think he's from Pittsburgh that listens to the show. Yeah, I remember him 100%. He's catching up on some old episodes. Let's listen to what Zach has to say. Hey, what's up, guys? It's Zach from Pittsburgh again. I am calling in regards to the episode. Um, I'm a little bit behind. There was an episode with a lady riding into town on her horse and uh, got in trouble for that and then vindicated and she was allowed to bring the horse into town. Um, The one thing I'm calling about, though, is uh, the mayor said egg and um, you guys were supposing that he was talking about eggs uh, I actually think it might have just been an accent thing or him miss saying it and him saying ag which means uh, agriculturalism uh, farming cultivation of land and such uh, so I think he's saying they're an ag community uh, an agricultural community a farming community just my thoughts on the matter yeah, Zach's just catching up on some old episodes. <laughs> well, wait till he starts listening to the episodes <laughs> that he missed yeah. after. He's, he's going to listen to that episode. He's going to freak out when he listens to the next one. <laughs> he's going to feel like a fool when he realizes <laughs> that he called in and left a voicemail about something that we were screamed at for weeks about. <laughs> A little late to the game, Zach, but we yeah. always appreciate the feedback, of course. Yeah, uh, I had a good laugh when I went through the voice memos and heard that one. <laughs> uh, let's yeah, get it. it's funny because I didn't even, when he said the horse lady, I was like, oh yeah, I remember that story. And for a second, I forgot that that was the ag versus egg story. That was so where was the like, trouble oh, all what's started. What's he going to say about that? You know, and all of a sudden I'm like, oh yeah, well, 
Here we go again. Here we go again. Uh, that was funny. Uh, let's get into it, though. We got a whole bunch of stories. We're going to hear the harrowing tale of a dog on a cliff in New Brunswick. We're going to hear about a jackpot in small town Newfoundland. We're going to hear about a woman who possibly is in love with an octopus. And then we're going to talk about the tale of the camera at the Noah Kahan concert. Whoever that is. Is it Kahan or or Khan? Uh, it's spelled Kahan, K-A-H-A-N. I always thought it was pronounced Khan, but we'll get 90 voicemails to correct us. Okay, well, well, maybe we should just start with that story then. Let's start it there, yeah. Let's do, you, do it. So Noah Khan or Kahan is a musician. Do you know them at all? I don't know anything about them. Never heard their name until this story. I, I Googled them and looked at a picture never seen them in my life and i listened to a piece of a song that i had never heard before do you know anything yeah about them? i what the very little that i do know is that i think he, he had written this song and put it up on tiktok whatever and then all of a sudden it got shared by mm -hmm. a gazillion people and he turned into one of the biggest musical acts in the world it seems like it's kind of sad as as musicians ourselves self-declared musicians nowadays it's like you need to like be big on tiktok to get your song up there i, I kind of yeah. feel bad for them being like i'm this great songwriter do great stuff but how do i like go viral um anyway mm -hmm. that's not even what this is about that's just a side note this the reason we're discussing noah khan's concert on keep canada weird is because when jose atkin learned one of her favorite musicians was coming to Saskatoon, Noah. She did everything she could to get the best seat possible. But when the best seats possible were further back than she had hoped, she got creative. This is the story of Jose's disposable camera at the Noah Khan concert. American singer-songwriter Noah Khan made his way to Saskatoon for a performance over the Easter long weekend. And as Stacey Hine tells us, one woman developed a unique way to connect with others at the concert. <laughs> Josie Aitken has been a Noah Kahn fan for years. When she heard he was coming to Saskatoon, she wanted to make the most of it. I was just driving, thinking of things to do, pictures to take. That's when the 25-year-old decided to bring a disposable camera to the concert for everyone to take pictures with. I just ran with it from there. I went, got two cameras and put my name, a tag on it with my name, contact number, and then what my plan was. She started passing it around with a goal of getting it to center stage. It was cool because before the concert even started, you could see the disposable camera getting picked up and pictures getting taken. Eventually, it made its way to Amelie Kish. It's kind of confused. I was just like standing there talking with my friend and someone tapped my shoulder and handed me this camera. And there's a little tag on it with a story. And I, I read it and I, I cried because I was like, this is so cute. She says a security guard asked Khan's team if he could take a picture with a camera, but the team said no. Meanwhile, she kept Aitken updated throughout the night. Like, I got your camera on front row. Unfortunately, they won't be able to take photos like with Noel with the camera, but I got it. Kish returned the camera the next morning. It's so special that it ended up exactly where it was supposed to be. It was just something cool that I experiment and I wasn't really afraid to lose out on it. Aitken says she's looking forward to getting the photos developed. Uh, she had a good idea. If you can't, if you want to get a great shot, you know, passing a disposable camera up the front, there's a cool story behind it. Uh, it seems like she did accomplish her mission. The camera did get up to the front, but he wouldn't take a picture with it. Come on, who is this guy? No, he, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's Noah Khan. He is a big deal. Or as we like to call him, Kahan. Yeah, or as I like to call yeah. him, like, too big to take a picture on her disposable camera in Saskatoon? What's he worried about? Why would you say no? Well, I get the way they structured it in the story was that his team said no. So I don't know if they directly asked him, but they certainly who has a team? asked somebody who represented him and they said no. So I don't know. Hmm. Um, it's it's too bad because it is a cool story. It's a cool way to to capture all the random moments in that concert and yeah it's unfortunate that uh noah khan didn't didn't have the 
to have the camera in his hands. Yeah, the yeah. perfect end to that story is the last photo on the camera is him taking a selfie on stage with the crowd behind him cheering. Like that'd be a beautiful moment to end it. Oh, be perfect. And but no. Yeah, it's it's too bad that that it didn't work out that way, but it's a neat idea. Uh, from what I gather from the news report is that she hasn't gotten the the film developed yet. <laughs> that's the second. That's the second part of this story because this is already on the news. And I, I, I was actually I was watching the news clip earlier and thinking about this and talking to my son about it as well. He was watching with me, my eleven year old, and we were wondering like how many like butts and penises are going to be included. Yeah, in that camera. was where I was about to go. Yeah, is how many <laughs> pictures of people's private parts did. <laughs> is going to end up on this role of film. Yeah, I'm so surprised that's that, yet to be determined. I'm surprised that she went on the news without getting the film developed, but I guess nowadays like there is there one hour film development places in Saskatoon? You probably got to mail it somewhere. I don't even know where you'd get traditional film developed. Yeah, I think you have to mail it in now. Yeah. So it probably takes a lot longer than when back in the day there was a photo place, you know, in every mall and every downtown. And every Walmart and, for a long time had them too. In every Walmart, yeah. So you could go there and get your film developed right away. But now it's probably much more of a process. Yeah. But you can buy weed uh, and drugs at uh, liquor stores. And I was at Canadian Tire mm -hmm. and I saw they sold, you know, those things where you, it's like a little metal circle, like cylinder, and you put marijuana in it and you turn it. Yeah, to grind up your your weed. Canadian yeah. Tire sold those. And I was like, what a brave new world yeah. we're living in. Yet you can't get film developed. Well, we're, we're talking about the future, not the past. That's a you good know. point. But what is the... So... Yeah. But the... Here's my thoughts on this, this story. How does this get in the news? How did they find out about this? Because I, I would have thought, like, let's say she gets that amazing photo of Noah Khan taking the selfie with the crowd behind her. It gets put up online and shared all over the place. The news finds out about it and it talks to her. How do they know about it before she even has the film developed? I don't know. Maybe... Word of I mean, they talked to some of the people who had actually handled the camera mm -hmm. in the audience that night. So um, uh, maybe one of them reached out. Maybe one of them knew somebody who worked in the news department and was like, Hey, you know, or social media, probably actually, yeah. um, maybe she was posting about it on social media and the word spread that this happened. And then someone from a news organization reached out to her, mm -hmm. uh, could probably be the way that it happened. Yeah. Uh, either way, I hope they do a follow-up when her film is developed with as few nude pictures as possible. That makes total sense. And that's all we hope for when we pass cameras around. Um, yeah. Well, we got a lot more to get into. I think that story was a little dark because I think Noah Khan kind of, uh, or at least his team, if we want to put it on them, they kind of ruined that story by uh, saying no to her, I think. So I, th I felt that story was a little sad. Let's move on to a story that's a bit happier. You want to hear about the harrowing tale of the dog on the cliff? Of course I do. I knew you would. Uh, this takes us to New Brunswick, our neighboring province. This, the story starts when Penny, a one and a half year old dog, went missing after playing in a field in New Brunswick. And we must say that the field is in the area of both cliffs and it looks like ocean. So there's cliffs and water uh, on, on all sides of this field. Um, the dog goes missing when search teams, including search dogs, fail to find any sign of her. Penny's owner fears the worst, but probably more so expects it. But almost a month to the day after Penny goes missing, she proves that she's a survivor. She beats the odds. Here's the story. One and a half year old Penny, a border collie beagle hey. mix, is known for hey. her energy and positive demeanor. And after her most recent adventure, the pup has added tenacious and downright lucky to her list of attributes. She's gone for 24 days on the side of the cliff starving. The only way I think she survived is because we had so much rain and storms and she was able to get water that way. Like many times before, Penny was playing in the fields with another dog, except this time she didn't come back. When her owners realized she was missing, the community came together to help. We hired a search dog, and we actually even came right along this area with the dog, 
And I personally searched this area several times and lots of people walked the, along the beach and along the top of this cliff and no one was able to see her. But this weekend, a miracle happened. When the man called me and said he found my dog on the beach, immediately I thought he meant he found the body. But then he said she was alive and I couldn't believe it. I couldn't get there fast enough. A local family who happened to be walking along the cliffs near Waterside Beach looked up and found her. According to a Facebook comment, Penny's rescuer, Tom climbed up the cliff and wrapped her in his sweater and carried her down to the beach. He threw Jim her collar and the owner's name was on the tag. It was unbelievable. I, I really couldn't believe it. I just couldn't. I was running. That's all I remember running. And when I seen her, I, I was so happy. Right now, Penny is at the Riverview Animal Hospital. She's not strong enough quite yet to go through her surgery. She has to have her leg amputated, obviously. It had gangrene in it from being so long on the side of the cliff. It's a bad situation, but she's getting healthier and uh, it's, it's looking good. Her other leg has a few stretch tendons and will require a special brace. But overall, the prognosis is promising and her family is ready to have her back where she belongs. Just to get her home and cuddle with her and hang on to her. I've been going up to visit her every day, but I know she'll be glad to get home. 24 days on a cliffside, drinking nothing but rainwater and not eating anything. Unless, I guess, the dog took a mouthful of rocks and mud. I think that's pretty amazing. It's outstanding that this dog survived and isn't in worse shape than what they are now. A missing leg. Um yeah, the, the leg is will have to be amputated, they said, and um, some other issues, it sounds like. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the, the diagnosis is that the, the dog should survive and, and will get better and I think it's pretty amazing. hopefully be back to 100%. Yeah, he must have, the dog must have fallen off the cliff, landed kind of midway between the field that he was playing on and the beach down below. So as the search party searched, then they wouldn't have thought to search, I guess, mid cliffside. But I guess the dog got lucky and fell and just kind of managed to get its footing. Some of the photos uh, th that are included in that news report kind of show him like kind of hunched in this one little pocket of space that he managed to fit in or that she managed to fit in. And I guess she just stuck there for 24 days. I'm surprised yeah. the thing could live that long. I always thought a human, no, I think you can go like a month without food, but you can only go like a two days without water or a couple days without water. So I, I guess this dog. Probably... Yeah, I think it's a week or something without water or something like that. Yeah. yeah. You're in the ballpark. Uh, but did you see the movie alive back in the day? Oh With yeah. The airplane, yeah, the mm -hmm. Indy Andes, the airplane crash with the soccer team. Yeah. That's yep. a crazy story. There's a remake of it, like a new version of it. There is. It was really yeah. good. I watched it. Uh, I don't know if it was on Netflix. I don't recall where I watched it. I watched it with her. I think it's on Netflix. Yeah, yeah. It, it was awesome. Uh, I remember seeing that movie when I was a kid and I used to fly a lot as a child because my mom lived in Toronto. My dad lived in Cape Breton and it was, um, it always freaked me out, but I was kind of just compelled by this idea of being able to survive uh, on a mountainside. I didn't like the idea of having to eat my friends, but just the idea of, sur of survival against the odds. Uh, when I heard the story of Penny on the cliffside for 24 days, I kind of thought this was the dog version of the movie Alive. Yeah. So how long would you wait, say you and I are in a, uh, you know, it's just I'm the pilot mm -hmm. and you're my one passenger and we're flying to somewhere remote in Canada to cover an, a weird news story and we crash. Okay. And how long would you wait before you ate my body? That's hard to say. I'd wait probably four or five hours. <laughs> four or five hours. I think I would start yeah. like with like, why couldn't you not eat like a belt or something? Wouldn't a leather belt be nutritious i don't know i would eat your belt i don't first. think so uh, you'd eat my belt you'd try that first and then I if guess, the belt didn't work then you'd move on to the main course i guess then again chewing on a belt would be pretty brutal <laughs> i don't know if you could eat a belt man i don't think you could but uh you could eat me the question is would you wait until i was dead or not or would you just <laughs> We go right at it. Um, but I have to fend you off and like I, don't, I can't even fight for my life. I can't even go there. I would have to be so hungry to eat you. So I, I think the honest answer, it would take like my last moments. I would eat anything in the world before I ate you. Yeah, I'm offended by that. 
<laughs> Sorry to hurt your feelings. Yeah, I would have. I would have hoped you'd be looking forward to eating me. Let's uh, end this conversation by being interrupted by a piece of listener mail. Uh, this is some feedback to, uh, for a story we discussed last week about the dumpster divers, also in Saskatchewan. Yeah, they're in Saskatchewan. Uh, here's June defending them. Hi, Jordan and Aaron. I just listened to your episode on dumpster diving. While technically I'm not a dumpster diver, uh, but we do pick up scrap metal from car garages, like rotors and brake pads, anything that's metal. And it is a very lucrative business. Um, so, um, you know, don't look down on it. Like if you say you go to your high school reunion and you say you dumpster, dumpster dive or you pick up garbage, it's actually you can you can make more than a doctor really um anyways uh there are occasions where we do jump in a dumpster because we found metal in there and every piece of metal is money <laughs> like no kidding even one brake pad you pick up a hundred brake pads you get you get coffee money I think June pleads a good case at the beginning, but I feel like her story very quickly devolves. It's like, yeah. I don't dive in dumpsters, and you should be proud of it if you do, because you can make more than a doctor. But then she goes on to say, we do on occasion dive into dumpsters, and if you collect 100 brake pads, you can afford a coffee. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, the comparison to a doctor's salary, I think, is probably inaccurate. Unless you're very lucky, if you're very lucky. I've never done the yeah. dumpster diving for metals for profit thing, but I do have one kind of connection to that idea is my granddad, when he was a kid, his family ran a scrapyard. So scrap metals were like a thing for him. And he would take me for walks all the time as a kid. And he would always just look at the ground for any little pieces of metal and he could identify them instantly. And he would just take them and he'd put different metals in different pockets. And then when he got home, he'd go into the basement where he'd have like, you know, just big milk cartons and he'd throw the little piece of copper in there, a different milk carton where he'd throw a piece of this in there. And he used to every so often, once he'd fill the milk carton, he would bring them somewhere and sell it as scrap metal. And I do remember him getting a good amount of money for like a big thing of just random metals he found on the ground. I don't think he made as much okay. of a doctor as a doctor, but he also wasn't doing what she did of going to like mechanics and stuff. Or what she yeah yeah i'm sure if you're going if you're putting you know a full-time amount of hours into it and and that's all you do is 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 locating you know scrap metal wherever you can find it and then selling it uh, i'm sure you could you can make it a decent living doing that mm -hmm. if you're putting the work into it mm -hmm. um but, but a doctor's salary, you know, doctors make a lot of money. But that said, you've probably met doctors that are pricks. And I've talked to a bunch of them. I don't think just because you have the the prefix to your name, that doesn't make you anyone special. If I meet someone and they, uh, they are honest, hardworking people and they are proud of the great work they do uh, finding stuff in dumpsters, I will shake their hand and say, you go get them, June. Yeah, but doctors these days are more rare than the rarest metals. So unfortunately, in today's medical climate, uh, we have no choice but to respect the doctors. I guess so. If any doctors are listening, please come to Nova Scotia. Yeah, we, specifically Cape Breton. Avoid the mainland. We really, really need some help here. We could use it. What is more depressing than driving by like one of those uh, walk-in medical clinics and seeing just a lineup like around the block of like sick people like, help me. There's one near my house and every so often I go by and I just see all the people and it's it breaks my heart. I'm so fortunate to have a family doctor um, so I, I can kind of avoid that when push comes to shove. But mm -hmm. man, this province got problems. Yeah, and how many of them are are in lineup because they're injured by dumpster diving for scrap yeah. metal. <laughs> I got hit with a brake pad. <laughs> yeah. uh, thank you for your call, June. Let's move on to the next story. Man, we got some good ones. Uh, building up the good ones for the end. Do you want to go to small town Newfoundland? 
or do you want to go to Victoria, BC? We have a story of a big win, and we have the story of love at first sight. We have a story that takes. Let's go to the big win first. Okay, I like. Because I want to end. I want to end on the on the love at first. <laughs> you got something to say about it? All right, let's let's go to small oh, town Newfoundland. Now there are a few promises we make on Keep Canada Weird. One of them is that if a cat's in the news, we're going to cover it. The second is that we will continue to follow the Tim Hortons issue, and if Tim Hortons is in the news in relation to that, we will cover it. But I think I have another promise that we need to make on the show, and that is if it's someone in small town Newfoundland wins millions of dollars in a lottery and they're on the news talking about it, we need to talk about it on this show. That said, let's meet the $5 million Richard Dennis Hobbs. He's from Keels, Newfoundland, a community of about 50 people. On behalf of the Atlantic Lottery, I'd like to present you with your check for $5 million. Dennis Hobbs finally hit the jackpot. Buddy, I was over the moon, man. I was like, wow, finally happened. Couldn't happen to a nicer guy. Help, help my friends out, my family. It's all that matters. He'd often dreamed about and spent three decades trying his luck, always playing the same numbers. 30 years, same numbers. And it finally came true for me. He's now the most famous resident from Keels, the tiny town of about 50 people nestled on the Bonavista Peninsula. His six big numbers finally hit in Saturday's Lotto 649. My bro uh, checked the numbers on the internet and he just popped up. He said, yeah, bro, you got her, man. You got her. And I said, yeah. I looked at the numbers. I said, yeah, I got them. I got them. A little small town with like 30-something people. We'll put this place on the map, boy. I did. Dennis Hobbs spent much of his working years out west, making money to support his family. Well, the support is about to get even bigger, with new cars for his children and some travel plans being booked. Yeah, you can't, can't sleep at night. You can't sleep at night. They're, they're over the moon, right? So, so happy for me, you know, you know, it's all good. I'm a good person, I'm going to do good with the money. Dennis Hobbs could barely contain his happiness, and he's unsure about retirement, saying he may go back to work with his crew for another year. But one thing is for certain, he'll live his life to the fullest. It's just that next morning when you wake up and uh, you're the next winner in Newfoundland. What a feeling. Yeah, especially the one winner, me. <laughs> Not a share of two or three winners, it's just on the winner. Max Jackpot, so uh, I'm, I'm so happy. I'm over the moon. Yeah, let's good times roll. <laughs> Dennis Hobbs isn't the only winner. He purchased his ticket at Taylor's in Kings Cove, and that store gets 1% of $5 million. I love when like a real person gets on the news and uh, Dennis Hobbs is, is the real deal, um, perfect representation of small town Newfoundland. Yeah, yeah, he's a he's a card, as they'll say. Yeah, he's a he's a real card. But he's the way he approaches his win. It, it's as if there was some kind of skill involved. Mm -hmm. he, like, he sounds he, like he won a boxing match. <laughs> yeah, he's like, we did we it. Did it? You know, uh, we're, I put it. I put put the town on the map. I did it. I did, it. did it. You know, it's like you didn't do anything. <laughs> like you just thirty years ago, you picked a series of random numbers. And repeatedly played those numbers, losing every time for 30 years. Mm -hmm. And then finally, you know, law of averages or whatever, <laughs> it, it, it just happened yeah. to win. It, it, and then it did. He, there was no skill involved. It did hit a little weird to hear the way he was described. Like, we did it. We did it. Like, ah, we put keels on the map. We did. It does sound like the like yeah. a, like a Rocky movie at the end of against all odds. I managed just a regular guy from yeah. a small town. We did it. But then again, and it's not like they're they're mentioning any economic hardship that he was facing prior to his win. Like I, I think this. I think his attitude would be more justified if he was like I, you know. I was laid off from my job uh, out west, and I and I haven't been able to find work. I'm in a small town of fifty people or whatever, and and I was just about to 
claim bankruptcy. And then finally, the numbers that I have been foolishly playing mm -hmm. for 30 years just happened to win. I spent my last $5 on that ticket knowing yeah. we could do it, and we did it. But he's a guy that that's probably makes a decent living working out West and just been playing these numbers every year, you know, for 30 years. Mm -hmm. And But the way he approached his attitude towards the win was <laughs> if it was this like mountain that he had been climbing his entire life as if he had put all of his eggs into this lottery basket. He's like, I'm going to starve to death before I get out and find a job. People from Kiel's uh, don't give up. Yeah, we don't give up. You know, I'm going to put this place on the map. <laughs> and they're like, you can't do it, Dennis. You'll never do it. And he's like, you w just watch. You'll me. never win the lottery with those numbers, Dennis. <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm happy for this guy though. I think if, uh, you know, whoever filmed this piece, it's like a local Newfoundland news, they should pitch some idea to him. Like, can we follow you around for the next year or so and just see how like this kind of regular guy from super small town, Newfoundland adjusts to being like a five millionaire. It could be, what, what is the name of that show where the, the poor people find like oil on their property and then they move to the, is it the Beverly Hillbillies? Uh, the Beverly Hillbillies was a similar story. Yeah, I think that's, that's what, that's what I'm thinking of. The old, the old sitcom. Yeah. It's like about this family who is like broke on this farm, but then they find oil and they sell their farm for a ton of money, move to the big city and now they're rich and they're. Yeah, have, that's, that's Beverly Hillbillies. I feel like Dennis Hobbs could be kind of the modern version of it if, uh, if they follow him. I feel like he's going to have an interesting story of what this man does with $5 million. I don't think that if the, if his life becomes a TV show, I don't think he'll get past episode one because he's going to blow this money so fast. <laughs> it'll make your head spin. Maybe. I don't, by the sounds of it, and and judging by his, Just the, he could, his attitude. He could not even stand still on stage when they were giving him this thing. He was ready to rock. Yeah, I'm sure he was handing out thousands of dollars as he was leaving the stage <laughs> with his novelty check yeah. he probably tried to take his novelty check like right to some the kind casino. of casino yeah uh, <laughs> like, i also i got the check i did it i did it i think the news coverage was a little hard on him for a few things first of all they they corrected him at the end he's like no other winners to split it with and once it ends the interview with him ends it's like Dennis will also need to split with the, you know, and they're kind of correcting <laughs> yeah. him there, but they also included a clip that I think if it was me editing that piece, I would have removed. And that's him describing himself as like a good guy that like the, a better, there isn't a better guy that could have won this. That was just kind of, yeah, he was, he's quite confident in, in the fact that of him being a good guy, which sure really makes me wonder who is this Dennis? Yeah. We got to dive deeper into this, but yeah. And I was surprised at the, I didn't know that the store that you bought the ticket at gets 1% of that. what's 1% of 5 million. Would that be so 1% of a hundred is one, 1% 1 of a thousand is 10 hundred. Uh, is that $50,000 they get? uh sounds i don't know they get a bunch of money but... we can say yeah they do yeah yeah uh yeah i didn't know that that must just be like a regular thing but what does the store do why do they win maybe it's to encourage I, I them guess to because sell. they're yeah encourage them to sell the you know that lottery there but i i would love for this story to take a turn where dennis tries to take the store to court over their portion of the winnings oh they didn't do anything i'm dennis <laughs> I put this town I on the, the map. numbers. <laughs> yeah. uh, I picked the numbers. I'm the best. I'm the best lottery player in the world. Uh, Dennis, I salute you. And Keep Canada Weird, I think, has just found an untapped market of uh, weird stories and a cool way to view the country. And that is in the context of people going on stage and discussing lottery wins, because this is the second time we've done this. We're now covering Dennis Hobbs in, que in Keels, Newfoundland. And of course we covered the Barb and Tyrone saga down in Cape Breton, where the uh, lottery winners uh, went at each other and, and the whole thing ended up in court. Um, so I'm, I'm going to take a closer look at future lottery winnings and, you know, watch how, uh, how that unfolds. Yeah. In Dennis's case, we're starting at, the very first chapter of that story, where is uh, the Chasey Ace winnings uh, with Tyrone and his grandmother. Um, 
that was after every uh, after all of the drama had already played out That's true i feel like dennis is just got his winnings and the drama is just around the corner mm, yeah something's coming uh let's uh, hear from a few more listeners before we move on to our final story of the evening let's hear from actually i got a i got a duo of, of voicemails here you remember i requested listeners of the show contact us uh, I request that listeners from the show that live outside of Canada contact us and let us know why they listen and why they enjoy a show so Canadian, so Canada centric. We heard from a few. First is Charlotte, who is a listener from California, who's willing to let us know why she listens. Hey, Aaron and Jordan. This is Charlotte from California. I'm a little late, but I wanted to say that uh, I listen to your show because. Um, I love the idea of Canada. I really haven't been, aside from a stopover in the Vancouver airport, which was lovely. Um, but down here, a lot of us liberal, lefty-leaning people uh, sort of have this romanticized idea about Canada, that people are more progressive, that life is better in Canada. Um, whether that's right or wrong, I don't really know. Uh, but as I've continued listening to your show, I've really just grown to find comfort in hearing your voices. Um, I love Aaron Airport. Every time he says something, it's often exactly what I was thinking. Um, I suppose that's weird and parasocial. I don't know. Um, but I just wanted to let you guys know that I do really love the show. I'll continue to listen to it. As for Peter in the urinal, I think both women are partnered with a man named Peter, and the one woman was asking the other woman, where's my Peter? To which she responded, your Peter is in the urinal. And I'm sure they had a good laugh, much like me and my sister anytime in such an innuendo comes out. Thanks. I should have set that up better, but uh, yeah, June uh, expressed her appreciation for the show, which I appreciate, June. Thank you. I'm glad to have you here. But she also weighed in with a theory on kind of the quiz we got last week where we had a listener tell us or, or ask us what they think may have led to the inside joke between them and a good friend with uh, my Peter is in the urinal. Um, I think June's theory on that was pretty good. Yeah, it was it was a pretty good theory. Yeah, but yeah. but if your um, if your partner, your boyfriend or husband or whatever named Peter was in the bathroom using the urinal, I don't know if you'd say was in the urinal. I would say was in the bathroom or at the urinal. Yeah, yeah, and she screamed it too. So there's because in the voicemail from last week, she specified that she had yelled, "Your Peter is in the urinal." Uh, unless her Peter, her husband fell landed in the urinal and was like oh he's all drunk in the urinal i'm drowning yeah, and she went out to get help she's like your peter's in the urinal maybe uh yeah maybe yeah i don't know why if she, if she already knew about it why she wouldn't have already helped, helped peter him. and then your peter was in the urinal i helped him out yeah that would make more sense uh, i will say that i have heard from the listener who presented that quiz and an explanation is coming probably in our next episode. I hope we will learn the truth of what they meant by that. Okay. But she hasn't, she hasn't given us the explanation yet. No, she sent me her an email with her address asking me to send stickers to her for her <laughs> airing the voicemail. Yeah. And, send the stickers. Then you'll get the answer yeah, then, is what she said. Like, pretty much. And she said, when I get a chance, yeah. I'm going to send you another voicemail. So it is coming. I hope. Okay, it sounds like she's a little vague as if, if she's actually going to give us the answer. If not, not. she's not getting it. If she's not, I'm sending her a sticker with like "screw you." Or I think you of. need to hold the stickers over her head and be like, "No stickers until we get the answer." <laughs> All right, it's done. You heard it here. That's the way we're going to handle this, like adults. Yeah, we got to be tough, <laughs> tough and firm. Uh, let's hear one more, and then we'll move on. This is uh, this is Ross from the U.S. Uh, coming to bat for. You remember last week we talked about uh, I was in the United States, so specifically I was in Florida. Uh, I did get some blowback from listeners saying like Florida is in the United States, but not representative of the United States. So check yourself. And yeah, I probably should be clear. Florida is known as the crazy place. So, uh, But anyway, um, this voice memo 
relates to me at the beginning of last week's episode, kind of saying maybe I've grown to appreciate Tim Hortons a little more after spending so much time in Florida drinking Dunkin's. Here's Ross. Hi, this is Ross down in Portland, Maine. Um, just listened to your latest episode where you talked about comparing Dunkin' Donuts to Tim's. And I have to say, when Tim's did move down here, it was exciting because everybody was looking forward to it because it was a higher quality than the Dunkin's that we've got here. Um, and then as we've had time has gone on, they've slowly, slowly left the area. So it's been disappointing. Thank you. Bye. I actually, I think that kind of hits on a few things we talked about. So they're saying yeah. Tim's comes across as a bit higher quality than Duncan's and they were appreciative of the Tim Hortons invasion of their area. But then like a prior voicemail we had from another listener, mm -hmm. Tim Hortons set up shop, went to battle, probably won the battle and then just bounced and up and left. Why are they doing that? Yeah, I'm not sure. I, I, it, obviously they're if it was profitable for them to stay they would stay yeah. i can't see them being like oh well we've we've won this area and we're making tons of money and we've squashed the competition so let's get, let's out, get of out of here, here. Uh, it, although businesses like it's it's interesting how they'll invest money to expand i i think back to i guess it was pro about 12 years ago now there was a massive surge of uh target stores all across Canada. Target moved in from the US down into Canada. They opened stores all across the country. Um, and then just unceremoniously, like a year and a half later, two years later, every one of them shut down and they left Canada. And they must have they must have spent billions of dollars setting up shop yeah. and then just leaving. Uh, my understanding of the whole th situation with Target was that it had something to do with um, the shipping of goods, they had a hard time distributing the goods across Canada, and it just made sense to retreat back into the U.S. But that sucks. I, I miss Target. I prefer them over Walmart. I liked Target. It is harder to do business in Canada when you're coming from the United States. And yeah, the, the logistics of it is harder. It's more expensive. Uh, big area. Um, so I to totally move. get yeah it's it's a vast area so like if you know you've got targets in all different parts of the country you know that's a lot of distance in between each target and uh it can be yeah really hard to get your inventory where it needs to be and really expensive so uh, and i wonder if this comes into play as well but in canada we have like laws about uh bilingual packaging oh that's a big thing yeah yeah either way that's irrelevant for this tim horton situation what they're up to yeah is this different. situation is yeah completely different I, I think that they're i think it's odd that we're hearing from people listeners who who speak of these tim hortons coming into their areas and they speak fondly of them mm -hmm and say that they're better than Dunkin's, they're better than the coffee shops that are there. But I think those are cases that don't relate to the overall general feeling of Tim Horton's coffee. Yeah, uh, the Tim Horton's issue is a multi-headed beast, and we are just t uh, at the tip of the iceberg in understanding it on the show, but we'll continue to follow all the various threads of it. But we don't have time yeah, for that. We'll now. do our best to, yeah, we'll do our right. best to. It's a Tim Hortons as a company as a whole is a riddle wrapped in an enigma. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of there's a lot for us to wrap our yeah. minds around. So it's going to take years and years, our entire lives, mm -hmm. to complete this saga. Exactly. We'll spend thirty years and then we'll put our damn town on the map. Yeah. <laughs> Let's get on to. One of the stranger stories I've come across uh, during my time researching for Keep Canada Weird. This story takes us to Victoria, BC, and I don't know what to make of it. I'm just going to title this, this piece, I'm in love with an octopus. Catherine Debrolowski's regular walks on a beach in Victoria, BC were supposed to be a way for her to find peace and get away from the hustle and bustle of the big city. But after a chance encounter with an octopus, Catherine found so much more than inner peace. She found a new friend, she found purpose, and maybe she found the real meaning of love. 
Here it comes. When Catherine Dobrovolsky began her daily walks by the water, she never expected to form a friendship. I just wanted to get some exercise in, enjoy the fresh air. But Catherine soon realized she wasn't alone in being active by the ocean. Every day there was something new here. It was just, it became addictive. While the creatures Catherine encountered and caught on camera were countless, there was just one that really captured her imagination. Just watching it camouflage and the way it moved, I was hooked, I was hooked. Catherine kept her eye out for other little octopi until one day she noticed a big blob. I just said, oh my God, I gotta get a better, closer look. Catherine was surprised to find the biggest octopus she'd ever seen, who rushed to get a better, closer look at her too. I'm scared. The grip was so tight, it felt like I was getting my blood pressure taken in my legs. And I was petrified. I was freaking out. Catherine attempted to calm herself down by taking big breaths. I just all of a sudden started to relax, and then he did. The octopus loosened its grip, left her leg, and transformed into a shape that felt like the start of a wordless conversation. You're, you're, there was a connection. You're having he a... felt me and I felt him. Oh, you're beautiful. And they spent the next hour together. Look at you. It was the best day of my life. Before continuing their conversation over the past few weeks. Oh my God, he ever soft. He's sort of like an underwater puppy dog now. Love you. Now, Catherine says the octopus she calls baby seems to recognize her, regularly swimming up to her leg to give a hug and receive an appreciative pat. Oh, look at you. Oh, you're so pretty. Now we're, we're buds. <laughs> and their friendship, Catherine says, is powerful and a privilege. I was giving him love and he gave me love back. A love that Catherine hopes will inspire others to connect with the natural world with curiosity, appreciation, and respect. Great baby. Where do we start with this one? Oh, um, I don't know where to begin on this one because what's your, I'll ask you, you know, what's your general opinion of this woman? Um, <laughs> Should we both just agree with each other that she's completely insane? <laughs> okay, you said it. I'm in. All right, good, good. <laughs> I yeah. agree. It, it is a really <laughs> weird take on like she went. It, it seems like what happened is she was walking on the beach. She saw an octopus and it kind of swam up and kind of wrapped itself around like her rubber boots. It looked like she was wearing, but yeah. in her mind, I gave love, and it and it felt it and like sent love back. And it was this beautiful moment when it like she touched it and. You're so beautiful. Look how soft you are, baby. It's just a really weird connection to have with an it octopus. It was the best day of my life. Yeah, the best day of your life was the day yeah. the octopus. I hope she doesn't have kids and stuff. Because imagine hearing she your mom. She definitely has no other. Hu she has no human in her life that she talks to. She has no other connection in her life at all. She has an octopus then that rubbed up against her boot. She finds this octopus and she's like, this is what love is. <laughs> But this is what I've been reading about. To describe the moment you got your, uh, uh, you had an octopus wrap around your boot for a second and let go as the best day of your life. That is I such a sad story. I guarantee the octopus was trying to drag her into the ocean. Yeah. Drown. Can I kill this? No. Yeah. <laughs> can I eat or kill this? <laughs> Those are my options and the only things that I care about. Yeah. And she, I'm an couldn't. octopus. Yeah. And it just stayed it. And the, just the little like moments in the clip where you, at one point, I think they did whoever edited that, that news clip screwed up because at one moment I can hear her say, I love you, but the narrator's kind of talking over it. And I think it should have, the news clip should have ended with her telling the octopus that she loves it. Yeah. Yeah. Because I it, love you. Yeah. You sit so soft. Uh, and, and, <laughs> Even the way she talks though, like it's, like it's a little it's, it is like she's deranged yeah she, like she's completely lost like the, her mind the biggest nut on the beach is this lady who goes down there and i wonder if it's even the same octopus every time that she finds or does she just see a random octopus there's probably a billion of them half dead on the waterfront of victoria she just goes up randomly like yeah kissing them i i like to think that she goes back into town and she's at you know, the bakery or she's at the grocery store and she's like, 
hey, Catherine, what are you up to today? And she's like, oh, I'm going to see my octopus. I love him. And he <laughs> loves me. It's like, okay, Catherine, go yeah. see your octopus. Okay. You know, like they, they come, everybody thinks she's nuts. And then she goes down to the beach and she harasses this uh, octopus Possibly. all day long. I could also see a situation where someone is just like, wow, Catherine, like what's gotten into you? She has a big smile, ch- shoulders back, walking with pride. She's like, oh, nothing. Or well, she goes, what's happened with you, Catherine? I met someone. <laughs> I met someone and we're in love. Yeah, they love me. And it's so clear. It's so plain to see the way they had this speechless, this wordless communication, this conversation that day there in the sand when it touched her yeah. boot and she touched it. Yeah, yeah. Well, Catherine, what's new with you? <gasps> it's what? I'm getting married. <laughs> Uh, that's I I knew you would enjoy that one. I it's where does this, where do these stories come from? And this is big news. When I was reading about this story, it wasn't one outlet that covered it. Multiple news outlets have covered the story of the woman in Victoria, BC, who has this special deep connection with the octopus. They were unable to describe this connection because, as far as I can tell, it touched her boot and she like kind of petted it. Hmm. I don't well, know. I mean, sometimes that's all it takes. Uh, love at first sight can be a very fast thing that happens. She described it as being kind of this like underwater weird puppy dog, but she talked to it kind of like it's a baby. But then when she described her kind of connection to it, it sounded to me romantic or spiritual even in nature. There is some really weird stuff going on on that beach in Victoria. And I'm not sure she should be very close to this octopus until whatever else is going on gets settled down no they are, i think we need to think of the octopus in this situation and protect the octopus and make sure that this woman isn't going to try and take the octopus home mm. and but god knows what would happen could we leverage the situation uh in our um in our work Relate it to the animal uprising. For new listeners of the show here on Keep Canada Weird, for years now, we have been tracking the increase in frequency and severity of animal-related attacks on humanity, on humans, to the point that we're, we theorize, speculate, and promote the idea that the animals are sentient, they're working together, and they're seeking a way to turn back the clock on society to a point in civilization to a point where they are in charge. Um, we've heard countless stories of set of things like this, but in this case, is this, if this connection is true between Catherine and octopus, is this opportunity for scientists to maybe get octopus and whales and so on on our side? Like I'm thinking of the movie avatar where all of the this battle is kind of happening but one person's connection with someone involved in that battle was kind of able to turn the tides of the whole thing could this be a situation where catherine is able to convince octopus to convince their community to call it all off no what i think is happening here is the octopus is is enacting a strategy Uh, because we see all different types of animals Uh, use different strategies to try and take down humans, you know, whether it's when, when you saw the beavers that, you know, had their dam break and flooded flooded the town. town. Uh, We see all these different styles of, of circumstances that the animals uh, are are using and experimenting with. We had the raccoon shut down the power grid in Toronto. Yeah, exactly. And so I think in, during the pandemic, there was that octopus documentary that came out on Netflix um, or something. Yeah. Yeah. Right. My octopus teacher, it was called. Yeah. And that was, I think the animals learned of this documentary uh, or are aware of it, of it happening. And, and so now they think that we humans, uh, have this idea in our minds that we can have strong uh, emotional connections with, with octopus. Mm. So this octopus is now using that as a strategy to get close to the humans, to gain their trust and then learn their secrets and then eventually turn on them. 
and and use that as their contribution to the animal uprising. Mm-hmm. And it's just at this point, it is probably a test. They're testing the waters to see if it works. And I don't know if this is a test. I think it's working damn good. Yeah, because now we trust the octopus. We we trust At least Catherine does. It seems like she'd give her life to save this little octopus and would gladly welcome it into her home. I'm sure, you know, we'll get an update on this story where she has brought it into the home and we're going to see the wedding photos. We're going to see the little bow tie on the octopus, you know, (laughs) sitting next to Catherine. And this is my new husband, Mr. Octopus. (laughs) Uh, What a weird story. Uh, Our promise to keep Canada weird by seeking out weird news stories continues to surprise me because every week it seems like there's something where i'm just like what in the world is happening this week it was the octopus story that just blew my mind yeah it was a pretty good one and and for the listeners who aren't watching the the live recording of this on youtube um seek out this story online and uh and and and, and watch it because there's a nice visual to this and you get to see the the you know, the eyes of, of Catherine, the octopus lover. Yeah, um, it's intense. I'll, I'll share the story in the Keep Canada Weird Facebook group as well. If you're not there, join that. And uh, any other Canadian news stories that are odd and unusual, dump in there because that's a good spot to uh, to share this stuff. But yeah, it is a hell of a story. Um, I hazard to guess what we're going to find next week, but... We're going to have to wait till then because we got to wrap this up. We've been through a lot tonight. Yeah, we've been through a lot, um, you know, but it's a ending with octopus love is, is a good way to end this episode. Yeah, I think that was a perfect way to do it. Well, let's put a bow on this, Aaron. Anyone listening, we want to hear from you. Go to nighttimepodcast.com slash contact and send us a voice memo. Anyone whose voice is aired on the show, Email me at nighttimepodcast at gmail.com and give me your mailing address, and I will send some Keep Canada Weird swag to you. But if you give us a teaser, like, you know, guess what this means, and you don't tell us what it means, we will not send you stickers until you tell us what it means. I'm looking at you, Peter, in the urinal. Yeah, yeah. We need to know what that means so no stickers for you and zach you got some new episodes to listen to i hope zach writes back and apologizes for bringing the whole thing up after we thought we were in the clear with this yeah we thought we were absolutely (laughs) past all of that um because that was emotionally a very hard time for you and i um all right well let's put a bow on this handsome aaron airport until next time jordan until next time You take a lot of long walks on the beach. At least you used to. Why didn't you fall in love? What's wrong with you? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I do love to walk the beach. I did meet a really nice lobster one time, and uh, I helped it get back into the water. But he never came back. Damn it. But I did fall in love. Just the love wasn't reciprocated. (laughs) Yes. Yeah, well, Jordan, until next time, whether... We're eating each other alive or eating each other dead. It's always going to taste like weird. Mm. We're not going to eat each other. We'll never get on a plane together. That's not, that's, that's, no, that, that'll happen someday. Someday yeah. we'll be on a plane together. I want to thank you for helping Aaron and I fulfill our mission to keep Canada weird. But let us also call out to you for even greater support in this. If something weird happens in your neck of the woods, please let us know about it. As well, if you have any thoughts, theories, or opinions on any of the topics we discussed tonight, we want to hear about that as well. The best way to reach us is by sending a voice memo at nighttimepodcast.com slash contact. We're excited to hear from you. Now, before we part here, let me end with some thanks. First, a big thanks to Aaron for sharing another evening with me and with you, the listeners of Nighttime. I'd like to send a big shout out to the internet's favorite cult leader, Unicol, who provides the intro and outro voiceovers for this show. A shout out to Monty Data, who provides the outro version of O Canada. And lastly, but most importantly, a massive thank you goes out to each and every one of you listening, as without your interest and your support, this show would be as pointless as it would be impossible. 
Now on the topic of support, let me thank the newest subscribers to the premium feed, Frosty, Shelby, and Jordan. Thank you for going premium. If anyone else would like to support the show, you can help us out here in a variety of ways. First of all, a premium feed subscription costs just a couple dollars a month, and that money funds the creation of the show. But the premium feed also gives you the episodes two days early, gives them to you ad-free, and gives you access to a full back catalog of episodes. If that sounds like something you're interested in, you can go premium at patreon.com slash nighttimepodcast. And even if you don't want to go premium, you can still support the show by simply sharing this episode on social media and letting all your like-minded friends know what we're doing here. Your support in growing this is very much appreciated. And until next time, take care of each other, hug your loved ones tight, and let us know if you see anything weird. Keep Canada Weird is written, hosted, and produced by the Nighttime Podcast. Check the numbers on the internet and he just popped up. He said, yeah, bro, you got her, man. You got her. And I said, yeah. I looked at the numbers. I said, yeah, I got them. I got them. In a little small town with like 30-something people. we we'll put this place on the map, boy. I did. It was the best day of my life. Oh, my God, you were soft. Love you. Oh, look at you. Oh, you're so pretty.